Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Dwayne Taves visits with Tom Field to talk about change in the agriculture industry and how to adapt to that change. Then enjoy this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Next, Kyle Bauer talks with Kevin Erbel from the Kansas Farm Management Association about profitability in cow herds. Then it's the Kansas Farm Bureau update, and we'll end with Plain Talk with Kyle and Dwayne. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first today, Dwayne Taves and Tom Field talk about the rate of change within the agriculture industry. Dwayne Taves joining once again here on Ag AM in Kansas and a chance to catch up with Tom Field uh, from UNL and Tom, you had an opportunity to talk to producers about uh, change and addressing those issues, uh, preparing for them potentially as well. We've always said and heard a number of folks have said that the only constant is change, but we're really at kind of a dynamic time right now here in agriculture. It's no question the speed of change is really what's the new game in town as things happen so quickly and there's so much volatility in the markets and and volatility in technology and, and changes that we really haven't necessarily been prepared for the, the, the access to talent, um, finding the right partners in supply chains, um, a lot of issues around producer-owned data. I think it's really, really important that producers or producer groups own their own data because there's that's where there's real value and real money. And then, of course, market access is such a big deal, whether it's domestic or international, that's so critical to, to all of agriculture today. We think about uh, some of the things that uh, that come along uh, in terms of technology changes. Uh, adopting them is great, uh, but uh, technology and, and information, you referenced, uh, the knowledge uh, really comes from that information. Applying it, though, and utilizing it in operation is a different, uh, a different cat, so to speak. Absolutely. I think, I think it's really important to know which ball it is that we're chasing from the very beginning so that when we when we go after a solution, we're actually going after a solution that answers the real question that we're trying to deal with. Um, so, for example, lots of in the cattle business, lots of the of our indicators are lagging data. They're, they're data we collect long after we can do anything about it. You know, um, yeah, weaning rates great, but I can't. I, I don't measure it until I'm I'm done, and and so I can't go back. So if I can figure out a way to collect data that helps me improve that in real time. That, that can be a pretty powerful asset. Um, individual animal health um, monitoring is a, is a great example of that, our ability to, to find a, a problem before it actually manifests itself symptomatically. It, it reduces the animal's likelihood of becoming uh, mortality. It reduces our input um, in terms of, of, of drugs and product, and it and improves the overall performance and ultimately the value of the product that that animal produces for society. We're dealing with a, a different generation of producers coming on. You've que- uh, referenced some numbers about how much land is going to change hands in the next 20 years. We hear that reference about uh, how we're going to feed that 9 billion people. It's going to be a whole new crop of people that are doing it. You know, when you really look at, at the, the whole ecosystem of agriculture, one of the big challenges, I think, is we have this huge demand coming at us, global growth population-wise, potentially a very large growth in in the middle class, especially in Asia, um, which means a a huge demand for protein. Then at the same time, we've got this big generation swap coming in terms of ownerships of farms and ranches. Um, Estimates are that 60% of America's farms and ranches are going to change hands by um, in the next 20 years. And that of the existing farms and ranches today, 20% of them do not have a known successor. And so that's a big challenge. And then our access to talent, just labor alone, um, is such a challenge. Um, are there going to be enough truck drivers in the future? Are there going to be enough uh, folks who want to work in a feed yard, in a dairy, on a farm? And so we have some real challenges coming at us. And part of that will be solved with technology. And part of it's going to be solved with, with really becoming a lot better at telling our story as an industry. 
Our thanks to Tom Field joining us here on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Are your cows practical or profitable? If you want them to be both, come to the Dale Banks Angus Bull Sale Saturday, November 17th near Eureka, Kansas. Selling 140 yearling and coming two-year-olds who have spent their days on the rugged pastures of the Flint Hills. For 114 years, the Perriers have been focused on providing hard-working, balanced trait bulls for progressive cattlemen nationwide. Make plans to join us November 17th or pre-register to bid online. For more information and to view our catalog, visit www.dalebanks.com. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Rob Schaefer, an Illinois soybean producer, serves as an American Soybean Association director, joins us. And Rob, everyone's still waiting for a new farm bill, but it's also affected several uh, programs because of the expiration of the current farm bill that affect the soybean industry. The farm bill technically expired on September 30th of 18th. So currently we're sitting in limbo, kind of like back in 14. We would like passage. We're trying to get a passage of the farm bill that passed both the House and the Senate, hopefully in the lame duck session after the election. The good news is right now it's still in conference, so the staffers are working there between both the Senate and the House and trying to work out some compromises between the two bills and make it one bill. Funding-wise, it really affects a couple of programs, the foreign market development and the market access program funding for each of those. Both the foreign market development and the MAP program, those are funds that are used for trade promotion and trade authority as far as sending farmers over to Europe or to Indonesia, India, trying to build markets and keep markets and build relationships with countries outside the United States to buy United States soybeans. Both have been very successful. They don't get a lot of publicity unless you're on a checkoff board or something like that. But those are very important programs and have done very, very good work for the United States, Illinois, and Kansas soybean farmers. You have an interest both as far as an Illinois producer is concerned, but you also have interest in Kansas. So you also look at uh, marketing as a very important tool. The more markets we have obviously means more competition than we have for our, both our beans or corn or wheat. All of our commodities, the better off we are when we've got a lot of people lined up. The more people you got lined up to buy your products, the better off you do. We're not having China for, you know, all the commodities in which they buy a lot of stuff. If we're not selling it to them, somebody else is going to. So we're trying to get that market back as quick as we can, you know, between the tariffs and, and then also getting the EU done, trying to get the new, I call it the new NAFTA done, and trying to get that done and working on a deal with Japan and some other countries. And it'd be really nice to have something to show China that says, hey, you know, the only ball game in town. They keep saying, be patient. That's not easy to do for that soybean producer. No, it's not. We were kind of hoping we'd have something in place by harvest. Obviously, we don't have that. That's how we got what we call the, the Trump deal, where the 82 and a half cents first go around here on beans, and then hopefully in December, another 82 and a half cents. We'll have to just see how that plays out. But like I said, we're trying to get as many trade deals in place as we can. You know, it's still, we've lost, what, $2 a bushel plus on, at least in Illinois, we've lost 2 bucks a bushel on beans, kind of making things a little tight for not so much 18, but it's definitely going to make it really tight for 19. Rob Schaefer, an Illinois soybean producer who serves as an American soybean association director joins us on the kansas soybean update it's brought to you by the kansas soybean commission the soybean checkoff progress powered by kansas farmers learn more at kansassoybeans.org for kansas soybeans i'm greg akagi hope you enjoyed this week's kansas soybean update stay with us after the break for more with kyle bauer and kevin herbal What if sustainability were synonymous with U.S. soy? If energy efficiency, water quality, and soil health help define U.S. soy's value, that future is here, the time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is committing to sustainability that's achievable, worthwhile, and enduring. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. All over the country, more and more communities are making the change to biodiesel, made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues, improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans while adding billions to our national economy. 
Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. You can always email me at Corey at SureCropFertilizers.com and with any questions you have, we'll be glad to answer and work with you. Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit HardyAviationINS.com. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now we learn about the Kansas Farm Management Association with Kyle Bauer and Kevin Herbel. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer visiting with Kevin Herbel. He's with Kansas Farm Management. We got to talking about cow herds. And of course, when you talk about Kansas, you talk about cattle. And certainly cow herds vary all over this state. Uh, but you have um, some data gathered that basically shows there is some commonality, whether they're north, south, east, west, big or small. That is correct. We've uh, been collecting information on cow herd enterprise analysis for uh, quite a number of years and beginning to take that data and, and use it to look at what is it that are the management factors that are most important for farms that are, are more profitable than others. Well, as you've gathered that data, that's from your members that you've gathered that from? That's correct. This is from uh, members of the Kansas Farm Management Association program. And these are farms that have a cow herd but have also kept their records in order such that they can manage the enterprise records and not just the whole farm records that they have in place. You know, that's one thing that I'm always amazed at with cattle is your farm with a cow-calf could look completely different than mine and neither one of them are particularly wrong. Well, it can be quite different and, and I guess maybe the definition of right or wrong would be is it accomplishing the goals and objectives you have? Are you accomplishing the purposes you're trying to achieve? And, and when we look at these farms, one of the things we do when we do the enterprise comparisons is go across a five-year period of time so that any one year, whether it's a weather event, whether it's you know whatever might happen to come in and affect that farm, we take it over this longer period to remove those. But the difference from the high profit farms to the low profit farms is more than $400 a cow. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So there's got to be several factors that affect that. There are numerous factors affecting it. Uh, some of them are income related. Certainly the, the pound of calf that you wean off of your cows, the, uh, the size of those cows, the, the cost to feed them, how you go about feeding them, uh, health management, uh, many different factors all enter into uh, how that profitability looks. So I'm going to start a cow herd tomorrow. You're going to tell me what I need to do to be that high income person. Tell me what I need to do. Well, hopefully you're starting the cow herd with, uh, with some sort of, of uh, equity to put into it to begin with, because uh, certainly one of the differences is uh, interest cost. So uh, a farm with a lot of borrowed money toward uh, operating that, uh, that cow herd is going to be at a disadvantage. So having a lot of debt to pay is, is a, a negative in the, the standpoint there. How you manage the feeding of those animals is very important. Uh, the most profitable cow herds tend toward uh, having certainly lower feed costs, but a larger share of their feed costs are grazing. So they're doing a, uh, a larger extent of the feed that those cows are consuming. Uh, the cows are doing the harvesting themselves. So grazing year round is probably the best I could do. Now I think within that, it's gonna always come back to managing the resources that you have. So if you have resources that you can utilize to graze year round, that's gonna be best. Uh, if you're in a situation where you don't have the availability of that to you, then it's going to be a matter of taking those resources you do have and acting in a way that, that manages them most efficiently. Is there a size of herd that's best? As far as uh, uh, profitability? As far as number of cows, uh, it tends toward uh, larger cow herds having more profitability. Uh, that's not always a, uh, a fixed uh, uh, 
measurement in there. We do have some of the smaller cow herds, not the extremely small ones, but uh, there's some smaller cow herds down at the 50 and 60 cow range that uh, are uh, showing some of the same profit uh, factors that are shown on some of the larger cow herds. But there certainly is a tendency toward uh, larger profits with larger cow herds. And the one last thing, because you gave it to me with with your uh, eyebrows, is there a size of the cow that makes a difference? No, and I think within that, uh, there isn't necessarily a size of cow. One of the men things I mentioned earlier was managing the resources that you have available. The, the operations, the, the producers, the managers that are doing best are the ones that no one understand the resources they have available to them, and they manage within those resources to reach, reach the most profitable profitable point. Visiting with Kevin Herbel, he's with Kansas Farm Management. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Come back after the break for this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update. I had this horse, it was a good horse, except when the wind was blowing above 30 mile an hour. Wind was blowing about 35, 40, and I saddled him up, rode him out to the end of the lane, and I thought, well, he's doing pretty good. And about six jumps later, I was laying on the ground, and thinking, boy, my shoulders sure hurt. I kept waiting and it, it didn't get better. And so I went to an orthopedic surgeon and that showed that I had torn rotator cuff. And said, well, I have to do surgery. I, I farm and ranch by myself. It's not gonna work out very well. I'd been sleeping in my recliner for about two and a half years because it hurt too much to sleep in bed on my side. And I'd heard about Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center on the radio. And gotten down there at eight o'clock in the morning and by 11.30, the procedure was all over. They just took some fat out of my side here and spun that down for about 45 minutes and then injected it in my shoulders and I was on my way. It's something you don't hear about but I thought it was worth a try and, and I'm really pleased. It's, it's really worked out well for me. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. As fourth-generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau Update. I'm John Buttenhoff. Uh, my wife Jenny and I uh, live in Lincoln County. We are representatives for 6th District YFNR. One of the things I really enjoy about Farm Bureau uh, is the, the policy and the, the political side of it and the, the information that we get and the, the fact that you feel like you have a voice or that you are informed and that someone else is able to fight for you in D.C. or in Topeka while we are at home on our farms doing um, the things we know how to do. Knowing the information and a lot of the information that Farm Bureau puts out is, is concrete and you know it's been uh, researched or refined and so you have good talking points to talk to people and being part of the YFNR committee has really opened chances to, to travel and see different parts of the country and then to interact with, with other farmers and ranchers from across the country. Sometimes that on my farm I feel alone that I'm struggling with the price of wheat or I'm struggling with how to transition the farm from my dad. But you talk to other people across the country and everybody's kind of going through the same thing so it, it bands you together. At, at our county level uh, we we try to incorporate people into our kids' ag day, try to show um, what farmers do in a, in a good light, put it in a good perspective, and uh, educate third and fourth graders. And we try to involve volunteers, help them to know um, what Farm Bureau does that way. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break with Play Talk. Tarwater Farm and Home has been family owned and operated since its beginning in 1978. What you need for farm and agriculture, lawn and garden, clothing and footwear, and so much more. You'll be surprised at what you'll find in this huge store. They have what you need and lots of it. So come take a look. You'll discover that customer service is first and foremost. Always has been with the Tarwaters. Tarwater Farm and Home, 4107 North Topeka Boulevard. 
Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways, of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. The new Better Horses Network is worldwide. Presented by Lucas Oil. Featuring worldwide radio and TV with iconic hosts like Al Dunning, Sharon Camarillo, Ernie Rodina, Lindy Birch, and Craig Cameron. With American Cowboy, Horse and Rider, Brushy Creek, Cavenders, and Ride TV. Worldwide radio and TV. The all-new Better Horses Network. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with the man who wonders, if poison hits its expiration date, is it more or less poisonous? Dwayne Taves. Yeah, think about that for a moment. Yeah. I'd say it's probably less, less toxic. Po- okay, because you bought it to be bad. You t- bought so it if to it's be not toxic. as bad as it was, then it's, it's better. However, I'm better not sure. Better. I don't want to be the guy that, you know, does a little taste test to see just how <laughs> sick do you how get you now. feeling now, Dwayne? Yeah. yeah. Here's a little fact or fiction for you, Kyle Bauer. Rainbows can only be seen in the mornings and evenings. Fact or fiction? Well, I don't know what you're going to say, but I know the answer. No, you can see it any time the spectrum of light gets right. So that would be f- fiction. That's true. No, it see. It can only occur when the sun is 40 degrees or less above the horizon. Yeah, well, I have been to Niagara <laughs> Falls. Oh, uh, that's you not can a rainbow. See, it isn't? That's what everybody says. Hey, hey, look George, that. look over there. Look at that, look at that rainbow. rainbow. Yeah, I'm. I don't know who wrote that. I mean, I've th- seen them in assuming, the middle of the afternoon. Yeah the the premise is that the sun has to be from the horizon forty degrees, forty you degrees just said that, or below. Right. right. Well, it can be straight up as long as there's the right angle to where the moisture is that the sun is. So you're going to give me a W or an L? I, I'll give you a W. All I'm, right. I'm going to recant. I'm going to yeah. fire my writer I was gonna who say, provided this information for me. You need to take that me. writer out and swoop him. I don't know what the exact angle is that it has to be to get that refraction of Yeah, I know it has to be at the right the prism. angle. That's for sure. Exactly so, right. You like my shirt? I got a new shirt. I'm really Sure. I'm, is it plaid? Yes. Oh it's my plaid. gosh. Dwayne Taves has a plaid shirt on. Isn't plaid in? Do you have any <laughs> do you have any shirt that isn't plaid? Yeah, I got a cup. I got some white ones. Uh, okay, go. Oh, you have a shirt that isn't white or plaid? Uh, not very many. All right. Well, that's what I would colors. say. Uh, you have two kinds of shirts. Long sleeve and short, and short sleeve, sleeve plaid <laughs> yeah. shirts. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but you seem to really like that shirt. It, it, I mean, yeah, it's the seventh it, day in a row you I know. Want. It's It's got reinforced cuffs. It just it feels good. I don't know. It's well, a, why does one need reinforced cuffs well, when you wipe your nose on no, your cuff? No, when you, you, when you find one that you like and you wear it for like eight years and you run it through the washing machine every other week when uh-huh. you wear it, the, the edges fray and they wear out. Mine fray because of my watch. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, it's only on the one that I wear my watch on is the only one that it frays your, your on. Left Yours frays, frays on both sides? Yeah, but it could, it's from the washing machine during What's the it, agitation. You get it caught in the ringer? Oh, the agitation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my wife would still use the old wire whip and and do it on the rocks. Maybe it wouldn't, wouldn't Yeah, and she'd just have to so avoid bad. the end of the, cl- of the cuffs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, it, you don't know. It appears that I don't shop nearly as often as my wife does because my wardrobe doesn't turn over nearly as quickly. Well, maybe you're just not as hard on your clothes as your wife is. Or I'm less likely to maintain fashion currentness. Um, or there's only so many colors of plaid shirts you can buy. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. 
closed captioning brought to you by Egg Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at eggpromosource.com.